Good evening. The microphone's working? Yes. Excellent. Good. Excellent. It's very good to be here. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, I look forward to uh, the evening. It's, uh, this is the 12th of 12 Deanery evening, so we've been round uh, the diocese on, on this tour. Uh, it looks from the numbers here tonight that it's uh, one of the better attended, but altogether we'll have had uh, around about 1,200 people, I think, uh, across the 12 uh, evenings uh, 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 over the course of uh, a couple of months uh, we've been doing it. And it's lovely to be uh, in Ecclesall. Somebody said to me this afternoon, we've obviously saved the best to last. I couldn't possibly comment, you know that. Uh, but it's, uh, it is really nice to be here. I'm going to ask you in a minute how you are, and I'm going to tell you how I am a bit. Uh, but the root of what we're doing uh, in these visits as last year are in these words Paul says to Barnabas in Acts 15. Uh, towards the end of Acts 15, after the big uh, uh, council of Jerusalem, Paul says to Barnabas, come let's return and visit the believers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. And then a bit later he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. You may not know it, but the word visit in that passage is from the same word from which we get the word bishop in uh, uh, the original uh, language. They don't sound the same in English, but they are actually the same word in the original. And a bishop is basically somebody who visits Christians and churches to see how they're doing. And also someone who does what Paul and Barnabas do. They travel and visit and try and strengthen the churches. So we're visiting, but visiting with a theme again. Uh, last year we looked at growing the body of Christ. <coughs> I remember we were in All Saints uh, together. And the annual rhythm of teaching the faith, sowing the seed of the gospel in the autumn, nurturing the faith of new believers, deepening discipleship uh, in the spring. We've come together this year to think about ministry for the future. I think the tone of these evenings has been a little more somber than the growth evenings uh, last year, uh, but valuable nonetheless. But that theme is in the context of uh, coming to see how you're doing and aiming to strengthen the churches. So let me begin by asking you that question that Paul and Barnabas asked. How are you doing? How are you doing? What do you appreciate about your own church and parish at the present time? What do you think God is doing? And what questions are you wrestling with for the future? I'm going to ask you to take a few minutes to talk to those around you. Good if you can talk to people from different churches. So by all means, stand up and move around and do that. It'll only be two or three minutes, so you may want to stand while that's happening. You may want to jog on the spot. I don't know. I'll leave that to you. Uh, but uh, ask each other, how are you doing? What are you appreciating? What are you wrestling with? Go. Okay, thank you. If you can find your seat, steal somebody else's, settle down. And uh, what I'd like to do is just um, sample some of the things you're appreciating and some of the things that you are struggling with. So if you can um, uh, call them out, and I'll call them back so that we don't we're not passing microphones around, but what are some of the things that you said that you're appreciating at the present time about your parish and your church? So, the, the love of the church family, the welcome that you receive. Yeah. Brilliant fellowship. Surviving an interregnum, still in it. <laughs> and in fact, that the um, numbers have in fact increased during... 
church growth during an interregnum? I'm not going to repeat that back to everybody. Di sorry, diversity. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Joining in. Joining with an adjacent parish. Somebody here said the vicar. The support of retired clergy. Very important, thank you. People coming from different parts of the country and abroad. Yeah, thank you. The worship. That's lovely. Thank you. I'm going to have to stop you there. There's so much you're appreciating. That's very good. Thank you. What are the problems you're wrestling with? Money, lack of. Money, lack of. Is that unique or is anybody else wrestling with that? Okay. What else? Sorry? The lack of children. Thank you. The vicars. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We may come to that later. Yeah. Other? Volunteers. Finding people to do things. Yeah. Lack of leadership. Right. Where are the people in their 20s, 30s, 40s? Very excited for us about the beginning to turn around in the nursery, starting with the things we used to pull against them. Yeah. Starting with those Beginning to move forward after inertia, that's really encouraging. Thank you. A couple more. Declining numbers. Declining numbers. Thank you. We should indeed love one another and accept people as they are. Thank you. Pressure of unbelief in society at large. The pressure of unbelief in society at large is a very helpful one. Yeah. Lack of confidence in the church living in this environment of uh, unbelief in society. Thank you very much. All very helpful and I'm sure not the end of the list. Let me tell you a bit about what I've been up to over the last few weeks, as well as doing these deanery evenings. I've had another um, uh, major commitment over the last few weeks, and that is I was invited in July um, to go in October to Rome. You can say, ooh. I've come back. I've crossed the Tiber so many times in the last few weeks but always literally and not metaphorically. The, the, um, I was invited, great privilege, invited to go to Rome to take part in a worldwide gathering called by the Pope, uh, a synod of bishops at the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, every country in the world, literally, elected from its bishops' conference uh, a number of bishops, one or two or three, uh, to go to Rome for this gathering, about 400 people there, 260 bishops, about 100 lay people, and 12 ecumenical delegates, fraternal delegates, of whom I was the Anglican one, representing the Anglican communion. The theme of the synod, uh, uh, which met over three weeks, uh, was um, the new evangelization for the transmission of the Christian faith. Long title. But what it's basically about is passing on the faith, and especially to those who've been baptized as Roman Catholics, but no longer participate actively in the life of the church. It's been a significant theme in the teaching of three popes. Um, it was really interesting. Everybody at the Synod got to speak for five minutes to talk about their situation. And the basic days at the Synod were listening to 12 of these five-minute speeches every hour uh, for about four or five uh, hours. So in any one day or any one hour, you could be going to Japan, to uh, Haiti, to Syria, to South America, to Ethiopia, to Ireland, 
to Canada. A uh, very, very rich experience and lots of learning in it for me. But here's the thing that was the most powerful bit of learning. After 12 days there, I um, couldn't go for the whole three weeks, not least because of doing these evenings. So I, I came home for nine days and got more or less straight off the plane on a Wednesday afternoon in Manchester and went to the Lawton Deanery evening <coughs> where we did what we've just done exactly with a, with a similar set of joys and things that we were wrestling with. And it was very, very striking and sobering for me to realize that I'd left behind this gathering of bishops from all over the world in Rome. Uh, and here I was in the Lawton Deanery in South Yorkshire. And it was exactly the same conversation. Exactly the same conversation uh, that we were wrestling with how to be the church in a changing world, how to be in the church in a world in which there is a rising global secular culture, a culture where belief is difficult. Uh, we're wrestling with questions of passing the faith on to children, to young people, to young adults, and uh, we're grappling with that in all kinds of ways. And we're grappling consequently with questions of ministry. Uh, it, has just been a fascinating experience to do the two things in parallel. And I was saying at the beginning of these evenings, because I do quite a lot of listening to other dioceses and other bishops in the Church of England, that every diocese in the Church of England is having a similar conversation to this one, and that's absolutely true. But I'm now saying at the end of this series of evenings that all over the world, the church is having this kind of conversation all over the world. And we are grappling and wrestling with what it means to be the church in the particular generation and the particular global culture that we are called to live in. Uh, and they all lead back to the themes we're exploring uh, this evening. When Paul and Barnabas came to strengthen the churches, they didn't come uh, and they didn't mean by that that they were going to bring a box of new members uh, or some new volunteers or a batch of new ministers or even some money, although from time to time they did do that. And that's not actually, it seems from the New Testament, how they meant to make the churches stronger. So I'm sorry, I don't have a whole coachload of new members or uh, clergy for you to take away afterwards uh, back to your parishes. Uh, there is a, a, a new booklet which you were given in uh, uh, as you came in and a pack of booklets for your PCC. I'll refer to that in a minute for you to take home and reflect on. And what we do want to bring you is what Paul and Barnabas uh, tried to bring, teaching and reflection and perspective on the grace and gifts of God and how much God has given uh, us. And that's where I think the church has to come back again and again in this conversation that we're, happening, that we're having all over the world. Uh, to have the conversation well, we must constantly center ourselves upon the grace of God and on how much God has given us. Unless we capture that perspective, it becomes a, an even more difficult a conversation. And that's why we want to begin our reflection on sustainable patterns of ministry, not on how poor we are, not on how stretched we are. I don't want to minimize the difficulties, but I want to begin the conversation by focusing on how rich we are in God and how much God has given us in Jesus Christ and in one another. The Bible's packed from cover to cover with stories. Many of my favorite stories, and I bet they're yours too, are about God's strength being made perfect in human weakness. 
Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who know their need of God, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we are poor, then we are rich in God. When we know how much we need God's help, then we're in the right place. So think of some of the people and the times that God used in their great weakness. Abraham and Sarah in great old age. Samuel, still a child, when he hears the word of the Lord for the first time. Deborah and Gideon winning battles against the odds. Moses seeing God supply manna every day in the desert when his resources were not there. David, called as a shepherd boy because his heart was right. Hannah, blessed by God in the midst of her grief. God is an amazing God. The story of Scripture is that God blesses his people when we respond in faith and as we move forward together. These are some of Paul's words. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing the things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. And when I look at myself and when I look at the church, I'm not far off when I think that I'm foolish and weak and low and nothing, really. But that's exactly the kind of person and the kind of church God uses for his purposes. And all of that is brought together in the beautiful story in John's Gospel, which in these evenings last year emerged as the Diocese of Sheffield's favorite Bible story. And I've thought quite a lot about why that is. Uh, but in these evenings last year, it was mentioned as people's favorite more than any other, at the feeding of the 5,000. And there's one moment in the story that stands out for people when you ask them why it's their favorite. It's the moment when in John's Gospel, there is a small boy who offers to Andrew five barley loaves and two fish. A tiny amount of food before a crowd of 5,000 people, 20 times the number, here this evening. But Jesus takes the bread, gives thanks, breaks it, and there is enough. In our diocese, every year, when it comes to ministry, I think we witness a miracle. A miracle. There's so much need in our communities. There are so many people in our communities, 1.2 million of them. And we serve, although there are wealthy parts of, of uh, our communities as well, as a whole, the area we serve is one of the very poorest in the country in terms of its economic wealth. So many homes, schools, workplaces. The need for the gospel, for compassion, and for help is enormous. And as the people of God in this diocese, we offer what we can. Often it feels like that small boy coming to Andrew. We make an offering of our time, of our talents, of our gifts to God and to God's church. And we encourage one another, every disciple, to make that offering. And Jesus takes what is offered, gives thanks, breaks it, and shares it. And there is somehow enough for so much of that need. So many communities and people are blessed by what is given. We all offer what we can because we know and understand, but we need to understand more deeply still that the church is not and never has been uh, just about buildings. And the church is not and never has been uh, just about clergy who do things and lay people who do not. We're a living community of disciples, baptized into one body, equally members of it. We all have different gifts, and we serve together for the common good. Sunday by Sunday, as disciples, we come together 
to be with Jesus in the Eucharist. We are fed by the Word of God, by the sacrament, and we are sent out for service in the world. And as you said earlier, the church is not about people who are all the same. We all offer different gifts together in the body of Christ. So what's the biggest part of the ministry and mission of the Church of England in this diocese? The biggest part is the ministry of ordinary church members, all of us. Your love for your neighbours, your Christian service, is a hidden root system spreading right across the communities of this deanery and way beyond and serving all kinds of good things. Now it's demanding to live and to love in that way. Active discipleship in workplaces and homes and communities has to be sustained and it's sustained by living worship in communities of Christians in parish churches all across the deanery. Those communities are sustained in turn by those who minister there, those who give their time and energy within the church and for the church. So thank you for all those who give their time in that local church which sustains our ministry. These are just some of the people who do that. Church wardens, secretaries, treasurers, thank you. Children's and youth ministers, those who do practical tasks, in church life, musicians, worship leaders, choir members, readers, those who pray and intercede, those who teach the faith to new Christians, home group leaders, authorized pastors, evangelists, pioneers who grow new congregations, ordained ministers, and I'm sure others I've not mentioned. We're a body together. Without all of these gifts, the body cannot flourish. And we can't do what we're meant to do. Each one's vital, and each is necessary to sustain that living, growing Christian presence, which is the local church. This is our common vision, and we're all involved. The Diocese of Sheffield is called to grow a sustainable network of Christ-like, lively, and diverse Christian communities in every place which are effective in making disciples and in seeking to transform our society and God's world. And within that overall picture, there's one thing we need to look at in detail. For many years, the diocese has been facing a change in our patterns of ministry and the way we do things like every other diocese in the Church of England, as I said. We'll face that change in a new way in the next 10 years. The number of ministers who give their time is growing. That includes self-supporting ordained ministers, readers, pastors, evangelists, the numbers of retired clergy. The number of ministers employed part-time or full-time by congregations in some places is growing as well. And that growth will continue in the next decade, we hope and pray, as our communities grow. But the number of stipendiary clergy, the number of vicars, is decreasing across the Church of England as a whole. It's been declining for some time nationally. It's partly about the number of clergy we can together afford as costs rise, and it's partly about the numbers of people available nationally for ministry. Good numbers, thank God, are coming forward to be ordained and the average age of ordinands is falling at the moment. But even more clergy are reaching retirement age. Clergy are vital to the ministry of God's church, as you know. Priests are ordained to lead God's people, to share with the bishop in the oversight of the church. They're called to be people of prayer, deeply rooted in the scriptures, to be channels of God's grace and love in the world. Priests are called to a life of service in the community to sustain and build up the church through the ministry of word and sacrament. No two priests are the same, and you know that in an instant if you look around this room at the clergy you know who are here. 
and thank God they're not. But they are all a great gift to the church. But we need to work differently. We need to think together about what God is saying to us through this situation. More volunteer ministers, fewer stipendiary priests. We have to work differently and learn to work differently in the majority of parishes. One alternative would be to leave lots and lots of parishes vacant and without stipendiary clergy. We think that's a bad idea. And uh, so do you, and you tell me regularly, and you'll probably tell me tonight. It'll lead to the decline of the church across the diocese. Another alternative is for more and more parishes to share a stipendiary priest, and for the clergy to try and work in exactly the same way across two or three or four parishes, and pretend they're really a full-time vicar in each one. That doesn't work either. <laughs> And you can see in an instant why not. The other way is to rethink ministry in different ways according to a pattern which looks something like this. And if you turn to the center page of your booklet, you'll be able to see it in a form where you can read the writing. And it's beginning to be a reality in some places in this deanery as in uh, nearly every other deanery in the diocese. Parishes working together in mission partnerships, mainly geographical, but not always. Stipendiary clergy normally working across more than one parish in partnership. Every local church developing its own ministry team of licensed and authorized ministers led by the stipendiary priest or priests every mission partnership seeking to grow new Christians through teaching the faith and planting fresh expressions of church so we have more congregations because we need that diversity for mission today. And every congregation seeking to enable the mission and ministry of the whole people of God in the whole world. And that whole picture is simply a response a necessary one to these two simple truths about ministry. We're confident in the grace of God and in God's provision. We have a growing number of committed disciples and committed volunteer ministers. We have a declining number of stipendiary priests over the next 10 years. We want to strengthen the churches and sustain a growing Christian community in every place the chance now to reflect on that uh, in uh, buzz groups, turning to the people near you, don't stay with people you came with uh, probably now, and just reflect on that picture and what it says, and uh, have a moment to think about it, and then Archdeacon Martin will come and lead us on into the evening. There will be plenty of time for questions uh, towards the end. Thank you. Turn and talk to each other. Well, I'm sorry to, uh, to interrupt you in your conversations, but if I can call us back together again, that would be good. We want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions uh, at the end of the evening, so I'm, I'm going to press on with the presentation, if I may, uh, just to give a little bit more of the detail, uh, and then, as I say, it'll be over to you for, uh, for questions from there. So really good to hear earlier about the many things that, uh, that bring you joy, things that are encouraging you in your ministry uh, at the moment. A real privilege to be able to, to hear something of that. For me personally, it's one of the things I most enjoy about my role as Archdeacon, being able to travel around different churches uh, and hear something of the stories of what God is doing uh, in different places across uh, the Archdeaconry in particular. As many of you will know, a little over uh, two years ago now, I gave up my role as a, a parish priest uh, in order to take up this role as archdeacon. And in a way for me, the past two years have been an exploration of different forms of ministry, 
observing and reflecting on the changing patterns of ministry that Bishop Stephen has been talking about. So I've had the real privilege of meeting the growing, some of the growing number of self-supporting ministers, both ordained and lay, across the diocese. Those who are really a, a very real example uh, for us all in, in their inspiration, uh, their commitment and their faith. But I've also had the challenge of working with PCCs as they face the reality, the harsh, painful reality of the impact of falling numbers of stipendiary vicars. So I'm very aware that being told that your church will no longer have a full-time stipendiary vicar can feel like a slap in the face or being kicked when you're already down. Such churches understandably feel that they've been singled out, that a harsh, critical judgment has been made on their ministry and their future. But the aim of these evenings is to make absolutely clear that no one is being singled out, but rather every church, every parish, every benefice is being affected by these changing patterns of ministry. And the only way for us to do this, while also remaining true to our calling to grow the church and to serve God's world and our society, is to do it with a real sense of partnership. A partnership, first and foremost, then, with God. Recognising that we are, as... Paul calls us co-workers with God, called to participate in the mission of the Holy Trinity. But then a partnership in ministry as well, a ministry involving all baptised Christians. And a partnership too in mission with neighbouring parishes working together with one another with a genuine exchange of gifts between those churches, the needs and opportunities of one being resourced through the abundance of another. So what might all of this look like in Ecclesall Deanery? Well, I know you've already had many discussions over recent years about particularly the deployment of stipendiary clergy. And I do want to pay tribute both to your current area dean, Lydia, for her leadership, but also to your previous area dean, Peter Ingram, who uh, not only began those discussions, but indeed led by example in taking on the additional role of priest in charge of St. John's Abbeydale. But let me cut to the chase. The current projections that we are working with for numbers of stipendiary clergy suggests that Eccles Hall Deanery, which currently has effectively 11 full-time posts, 8.5 people in post at, at this moment in time, but with three vacancies, either currently being advertised or about to be advertised, that will move to eight full-time posts by 2019. Now, I know that that's not what you want to hear, but I'm also sure that you would want to hear it straight. These are the best projections that we have based on both what we will be able to afford and the number of clergy available to us. So I know that the reality of that is already beginning to bite. All Saints totally have been very gracious in accepting the move from a full-time stipendiary vicar to a half-time vicar with a mission partnership developing with Christchurch Door. St. John's Abbeydale, I've already mentioned, working creatively with Holy Trinity mill houses. I know the change has been far from easy, but a real ministry team developing 
and new patterns of ministry continuing to be explored. The link between All Saints Ecclesall and St. Peter's Greenhill, yielding real fruit already at St. Peter's, proving that churches of different traditions can work in genuine partnership. So good progress is being made, but there is further to go. And that's why my primary call to you this evening as a deanery is to make, first of all, the development and growth of ministry teams in every parish a top priority. To be actively searching out those who may have a calling to ordained ministry, reader ministry, calling to pastoral worker, evangelist, children's worker, whatever it may be, but to be developing the gifts of the whole people of God and developing that ministry team. That then needs to be combined with creative thinking around mission partnerships. What can be done better together? Could resources be shared to help look after your buildings? Could resources be shared to help manage finances? Are there creative opportunities for reducing duplication? What are the possibilities that might emerge when we work together in mission in the wider community? We're hoping in the next few months to start producing resources to help parishes reflect both theologically and practically on the idea of mission partnerships. We'll be asking those emerging partnerships to work on mission action plans, detailing how they might work together in mission. We're clear that's something that only the churches themselves can decide. It's not up to us to dictate how people work in partnership. Rather, we can make clear the expectation, but then ask you to work out the practicalities. And alongside ministry teams and mission partnerships, I then need to ask you to come to a clear agreement as a deanery together on how you want to deploy the eight stipendiary posts that you will have in 2019. I know this will feel like going back over old ground for some of you, but we've said consistently that we will respond to deanery plans where they are clearly agreed among the whole deanery. The clearer the plans we have, the more preparation we can do in advance. And so in all of this, I hope we can hold on to the picture that Bishop Stephen gave to us earlier on, the five loaves and two fishes. It moves us from thinking about what we don't have to focusing on what Jesus can do with what we do have. Fix your eyes on Jesus, says Hebrews, the author and perfecter of our faith. And it's a picture we need to keep in our minds as well when we think about finance. You know that we have some of the most generous givers in the whole Church of England in this diocese. Into proportion to what they have, so many people in this diocese give sacrificially. And we can't say thank you often enough. Year on year, God graciously provides. And our income has remained relatively stable in recent years, a fact which is remarkable given the number of churches in vacancy and given the changing patterns of ministry which we've already mentioned. And thankfully, the understanding of parish share is, I think, beginning to change, a realisation that parish share is not about paying for your own vicar, but also actually a very concrete display of mutual support. The better off parishes, financially better off, supporting those who are less well off, and I hope receiving in return different gifts from those other communities. But you also need to know that even as our income has remained stable over recent years, the costs of ministry have been going up. All of that means that this year in particular, 
we've been facing a very serious deficit in diocesan finances. Something which we've only been able to cope with this year by taking some quite extraordinary measures. Measures that we know cannot be repeated again in the future. We're doing what we can to try and deal with that. There'll be a review soon of central posts within the diocese. We're looking at selling off some vacant property. The bishops are looking at launching a centenary fund for 2014, the centenary of our diocese. But it can't be said often enough that parish share remains the bedrock of our finances and the way that we resource mission and ministry across the diocese. There is a direct connection. If our income falls, the numbers of stipendary clergy will have to fall even faster. So we go on asking every parish to think and to reflect, to teach regularly about giving and about stewardship. Encouraging people to give at least 5% of their income to their local church. To give regularly, to give tax efficiently. Ideally to give by monthly standing order from their bank. Just as we ask parishes to give their parish share by monthly standing order. You know, it's a well-known aphorism that giving follows vision. If people have a particular picture in their mind of a future which excites them, which makes them say, I want to be a part of making that happen, then they will not only give financially, but give of themselves and give sacrificially. So in the booklets that accompany these evenings, which I hope you'll take back to discuss with your PCCs. You'll find many examples of churches all across the, across the diocese and indeed individuals partnering with God in mission. They make inspiring reading and I truly hope that you can hold before you and your churches these pictures of what God is doing with the loaves and the fishes that people are offering. There are so many signs of life and hope across the Diocese of Sheffield. And I hope and trust that you will join us in praying that God will continue to renew our faith and our hope in coming years. I'm going to stop at that point and give you an opportunity again just to uh, buzz, just to chat among yourselves in ones and twos very quickly before we then open it up for more general questions. Uh, for both Bishop Stephen and myself. So do just chat quickly with the person next to you and then we'll come round with the microphone.